What makes a thief? If you take one cent, or one dollar, or more. For some thieves, more is never enough. This is the story of one of the biggest bank frauds in history and the man behind it. The value of the damage is currently confirmed at more than six billion dollars, a vast sum. It was fairly clear that somebody had been stealing money from the bank. The challenge was more finding out where the money had gone and who was responsible. Personally, I served as a detective at New Scotland Yard for over 30 years, investigating fraud, money laundering. This is one of the most complicated and intricate cases I have ever investigated. The BTA Bank was established in 1925 when Kazakhstan was part of the fledgling USSR. Over the years, it went through several reorganizations. At its height, it was one of the most respected and reputable banks in Kazakhstan, with branches in several countries. But the 2008 global economic crash revealed the bank had fallen victim to a major loans fraud on a scale never seen before. Sergei Perov, head of the investigation department of Kazakhstan's anti-corruption services agency and one of the country's chief criminal investigators. During the global economic crisis, facts came to light about infringements of banking legislation by the top management of BTA Bank. This resulted in an audit being carried out. Based on this audit by the financial surveillance authorities, sensational facts came to light about the embezzlement of BTA Bank funds. Central to the scheme was the establishment of UKB6, a secret department that forensic auditors later described as a bank within a bank. The role of UKB6 was to administer loan applications and cover up any concerns raised by other departments within the bank. Chris Hardman is a senior litigation partner with international law firm Hogan Lovell. Hardman was tasked with tracking down where the missing money had disappeared to. The UKB, that's just an acronym, to describe the different commercial lending departments within the bank. Uh, one of them, UKB6, uh, was a particular department that seems to have been the focus for a lot of the fraudulent lending. Um, it was on a different floor of the bank's head office in Almaty in Kazakhstan. It had different security arrangements. Its credit approval systems were dealt with differently. And essentially, it seems to have been uh, the main center for the fraudulent lending practices. Over a four-year period, starting in 2005, the number of loans approved by the bank and managed by UKB6 increased by more than 1,000%. Around 200 projects each submitted loan applications to the bank, sometimes for several hundreds of millions of dollars. Once the loans were approved and the funds released, each project would disperse the money to a vast network of shell companies. Investigators believe as many as 30,000 front companies may be linked to the fraud. By the time the authorities were alerted to the billions of dollars missing at the BTA, resulting from the fraudulent loan scheme, the bank was on the point of collapse. Nurlan Nurgabailov is head of asset recovery at the BTA Bank and was tasked with deploying and coordinating an international team of asset recovery specialists. So you see the scheme. The borrower might be a Russian company taking, let's say, $300 million. And, but the problem was that they were not repayable loans. The only purpose was to take the money off the bank. Then the money went to the shell companies, and then we don't see it. In the history of Kazakhstan, there have been a number of high-profile criminal cases. But this one is unique in terms of the damage incurred the people involved, and the scale of the activities of Abliazov's criminal organization. 
In 2009, the government had to subsidize the bank because the bank costed zero. There were millions of people who were savings, salaries receiving from the bank, deposits, pensions, insurances, all kinds of banking market was dead. And that was the crisis period. It wasn't difficult to see that somebody had been stealing. We obviously had an open mind when we first started looking, but I'd say within, in a matter of weeks, there was no doubt that these loans were never going to be repaid, at least without somebody pursuing those ultimately responsible. Uh, and that proved to be quite a challenge. Kazakhstan is the largest landlocked country in the world. The last republic to declare independence from the Soviet Union following the collapse of communism in 1991, the country now has the strongest performing economy in Central Asia. With that rise in prosperity came opportunities for young, ambitious Kazakhs keen to embrace the new free market agenda. One of those came from a small, rural village in the south of the country. Mukhtar Abliazov. Ian Ferguson is an investigative journalist who has been studying the rise of Abliazov. Abliazov's educational life started where he studied in Kazakhstan theoretical nuclear physics. He finished off his university education in Moscow and came back to Kazakhstan and started trading in pasta, salt, cars and dabbled in some banking and the president of the country appointed him head of the state electricity board and this would probably be his first brush with the law because he was questioned about abuse of uh, power or abuse of function as they call it but then was appointed minister for energy he claims that when he refused to rejoin the government in 1999 he was in the job for almost two years and he maintains that the government framed him and he was sentenced to six years. After less than a year, he applied for a pardon and the president gave him a pardon. After his release, Abliazov returned to Moscow to pursue his business interests. But then in 2005, he was appointed chairman of the BTA Bank and returned to Kazakhstan. The bank appeared to flourish under Abliazov's leadership, and then the global economy went into meltdown, and regulators discovered a massive multi-billion dollar hole in BTA's balance sheets. Without offering an explanation, he fled to the UK and successfully claimed political asylum. Load me up, raise your bet, lay it all on the line, I'll be worth every dime, I tell you. Put your money on me. So how did Abliazov manage to carry out a theft of this scale and complexity that investigators believe amounts to at least six billion dollars, but could be much more? My knowledge is that there existed the organized criminal group headed by Mr. Abliazov. The idea was to provide very big loans amounting to hundreds of millions to the companies in Russia, Georgia, Kazakhstan, the post-CIS countries, even abroad. But those companies were actually totally under control of Mr. Ablyazov or his affiliates. He's been very clever to keep mostly the close associates are all family members, either sister, son-in-law, Felias Krapinov. Ilyas Krapinov, Abliazov's son-in-law, who investigators believe is responsible for maintaining and overseeing the assets today, moving them from country to country and always trying to stay one step ahead of asset recovery teams. This organized criminal gang, as the Kazakh authorities have described them, contain people who are now got refugee status in the Czech Republic, as his former bodyguard who was also wanted for an explosion, uh, an IED going off, is it got political asylum in Spain. But the Krapinovs and his sister in the United States are a key role in this, and he's involved all of his family in the dispersal of funds. And they're all living a pretty high life, but he's made them accomplices to a major 
crime and eventually if they're all extradited or arrested they will spend a great deal of time in prison. Sadukas Mamstegi, former deputy chairman of the management board at the BTA Bank. Mamstegi works closely with Abliazov and has consistently denied he knew there was fraud taking place. But the former BTA executive is facing additional charges for his alleged role in the scheme. As I said, during my time at the bank, no embezzlement took place, just unlawful use of bank funds by increasing the bank's market capitalization. In other words, the money always went back into the bank. Now I have stopped working there. I can't say for sure how much was embezzled, but mostly it was what we call pumping up the bank's market capitalization. In other words, issuing loans which are then reintroduced back into the bank. The Kazakh authorities were now facing an unprecedented financial criminal investigation. Such was the scale and complexity of the unfolding fraud that new investigative teams had to be established and the evidence quickly mounted. A huge number of investigators were involved. Several investigation squads were set up because there were so many different strands to the activity of Abliazov's criminal group. So a different investigation squad was set up for each of these strands. Dozens of investigators were involved. There are over 2,000 volumes of case files, including witness statements and other findings. Years after investigators began their work, the total value of money taken from the BTA bank is still being assessed. The value of the damage is currently confirmed at more than $6 billion, a vast sum. It is a very difficult task to figure out the exact amount of money that had been embezzled from the bank. But I strongly believe that the amount is very huge and starting from $6 billion, but not less than that. But due to the nature of international finance, the fraud extended well beyond Kazakhstan's borders. Investigators in multiple jurisdictions have now accused Abliazov and his affiliates of extending their fraudulent loan scheme in Ukraine, Russia and a host of other countries across the world. It's a very large fraud case. The amount of money that the bank had lost ran to somewhere in excess of $10 billion. Um, it wasn't difficult to see that there had been a fraud. A huge amount of money was missing. There were many loans that had been made to offshore companies with no security. The companies had no ability to repay. The BTA bank is not the only victim. I can recall that the amount of money embezzled from Russia, Moscow municipality, equals to 4.5 billion. We can maybe assume a couple of billions from Ukraine, you plus them, and you receive the unbelievable amount of money, going higher than 10 billion. But how can anyone hide six, 10, or even 20 billion dollars? Abliazov claims to have lived relatively modestly, but investigators quickly identified that the former BTA chairman maintained three private planes, 106 cars, 20 luxury villas, nine prime real estate office buildings around the world, and almost 1,000 apartments. But that would still leave him with billions left to hide. So, where did it go? This man is a former police detective who served with the Metropolitan Police for over 30 years, including many years with a serious fraud office. Due to the covert nature of his ongoing work on the case, he asked for his identity to be concealed. Al Capone famously laundered money through laundry businesses, hence the term money laundering. Our suspects, our targets are currently doing that, but on a grand scale probably not seen before. Basically, the criminals will form offshore companies in jurisdictions that are operate codes of secrecy, i.e. a company be operated by a nominee director and have nominee shareholders, therefore hiding the real identity of the owners. Thereafter, they will purchase companies in onshore locations, in western or desirable locations, and start to legitimise the money. Ian Ferguson believes Abliazov and his associates have exploited unstable third world countries, such as the Central African Republic, where it is suspected diplomatic passports were obtained in return for significant bribes. It's a bit muddy how he's linked to the Central African Republic. We, an extensive research has shown that sometimes passports are given from these countries 
for humanitarian work. We can find none and other people more expert in the country can find no humanitarian work carried out by the Krapanovs. Elias Krapanov did visit the Central African Republic and if you didn't do humanitarian work and you've managed to get a passport, then you've done something else, either given big political donations to an incoming president and the two stock trading things down there would be diamonds and arms. And in fact, Victor Boot, one of the world's biggest arms dealers, had a very close connection with the Central African Republic. He's now serving 25 years in Marion Penitentiary, Illinois. Investigators believe the acquisition of the diplomatic passports by Ilyas Krapunov was designed to give Ablyazov, his family and affiliates greater freedom to cross borders as they managed the movement of the assets and investments. It's really worldwide. Switzerland, the British Virgin Islands, Panama, Cyprus, Seychelles, Luxembourg, Belize, Mauritius, the United Arab Emirates, to name but a few. Basically their first priority is to operate in countries where the legislation of that country allows a code of secrecy about the ownerships of companies. So basically the, the companies are owned by nominee shareholders, operated by nominee directors, to anonymise or I'll keep the owners of the company anonymous. Recently, Ferguson travelled to Geneva, where Krapunov has an extensive investment portfolio. He wanted to find out how Ablyazov's son-in-law was able to obtain Central African Republic diplomatic passports. Using a covert camera, Ferguson recorded his meeting with Leopold Samba, permanent representative to the Central African Republic's UN mission in Geneva. Okay. Merci. Bonjour, monsieur. Ça va? Ça va. When I visited the mission and met with Mr. Samba, I came straight to the point. The, the reason for the meeting was to ask him how much it would cost for me to get a diplomatic passport. Um, Afrique, Central République. Je recherche pour un passeport, un passeport diplomatique. C'est possible? And I went on to ask him if I was a Kazakh needing such a passport, what needed to be done, and he explained the process. Mais ce que je vous dis, c'est la corruption. Il a fait comme vous, vous faites maintenant. Il amène valise de l'argent. Il va voir le président. Pour le premier, il dit Monsieur le premier, Monsieur le président, voilà l'argent. Je peux mettre à votre disposition un avion. Un passeport, je comprends. Un oui, passeport, attendez, un attendez, passeport, attendez, attendez, mais un passeport attendez, diplomatique. Attendez, je vous donne l'argent, je vous fais ci, je vous fais ça, et j'ai ma femme, j'ai mes enfants, j'ai mon beau-père, j'ai ma belle-mère, oui. je suis une famille, à ma terre, une famille, ma soeur, ma, ma frère. And I asked him for an introduction and he said, well, if I email him, he would maybe give me an introduction. So we needed to go higher up. For the passport, I tell you, I'm not, the I'm, passport. I'm not available right. to, okay. to, to do uh, something for you. But if you want to go to Bangui, I can help you. You can help me yeah, when I I'm in Bangui. You. I can help you, I can write to Bangui authority at uh, him, at him uh, a business man, uh, come to Bangui to meet, uh, to meet you. Uh, if it's if, if possible to, to give him a uh, diplomatic passport. And of course, as I'm leaving, I pick up my briefcase and he asks, is this the briefcase with the millions? I said, no, I need a much bigger one. Mr. Samba? Merci bien pour Merci votre temps cet après-midi. Merci. Merci, monsieur. Alors, la valise de, 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 de millions de dollars. Clearly, the Krapinovs didn't get their passports uh, from, the U from the Central African Republic by dealing with the man in Geneva. They've dealt with the people at the top. Uh, how much they cost, or what they, what, did they get benefits, the Central African Republic, from something the Krapunovs did or Ablasov did? One would have to say 
yeah, they must have done something pretty good to get United Nations diplomatic passports. Susa Jamba is an African journalist who has been covering the political situation in the Central African Republic for decades. According to Jamba, wealthy foreigners like Abliasov and Krapinov benefited from the corrupt government headed by former president Francois Bozizi. They figure in the narrative of the Bozizi regime, which also is accused of a lot of human rights abuses, they figure in the case of the passports. It was almost like a side business of Bozizi's son. And this son was also involved in arms dealings, um, currency dealings, and also in mining, illegal timings. In other words, they would facilitate foreign um, businessmen to come and mine diamonds illegally. Now, he had the control via some of his uh, Lebanese acquaintances of the passport office, and, and that's where the uh, Krapnovs and the Ablesovs feature in the highly corrupt sector. Ablyazov claims he is being subjected to a politically motivated campaign conducted by multiple international authorities, all at the behest of the government of Kazakhstan. When in 2013, Italian authorities discovered Ablyazov's wife, Alma, was carrying a Central African Republic diplomatic passport under a different surname, she and her daughter were deported back to Kazakhstan. Alma Shalabayeva, the spouse of Ablyazov, who is wanted in Kazakhstan for bribery charges and falsifying official documents. Deported from Italy for carrying a diplomatic passport in the name of Alma Ayan, investigators believe she acts as a conduit between Ablyazov communicating his instructions to other members of the network. The deportation of Shalabayeva and her daughter created a huge political storm in Italy with human rights groups warning Abliazov's wife would face persecution and even death if she was returned to Kazakhstan. But rather than persecuting Alma, the family were allowed to return to Italy unharmed, where they successfully claimed political asylum. The whole notion that he is a victim, I think is, is not supported by the facts. The, uh, he's been in prison, they could have kept him in prison, when his wife and daughter were deported from Italy, uh, the Kazakhs government could have held them there, one imagine, but they didn't. They let them return to Italy. And she's been granted, uh, the wife and daughter, political asylum in Italy. So this idea of the malevolent dictatorship does not appear to in Ablazov's life. He says he was tortured in prison. But he was released. He was, why, why would they be tortured and then, uh, then appeal for a, a clemency and a pardon, and the pardon's granted before you've served 12 months of a six-year sentence? Peter Salas, Abliasov's lawyer, refuses to be interviewed about the specific criminal allegations his client is facing from jurisdictions in both East and West, instead claiming the former BTA chairman is facing a fight for his life. Mr. Abliasov is a fighter. Uh, Mr. Abyazov is someone whose own political allies were murdered uh, in Kazakhstan. They uh, got bullets in the head, bullets in the back, um, and he's decided a long time ago that this is a fight for him uh, to the end. Investigators dismiss claims the case against the former BTA chairman is political and have ridiculed claims by Abliazov's lawyer that their client's activity was aimed at putting the money safely out of reach of the Kazakh government. At the moment when the whole sum of money was embezzled, the bank was not belonging to the government. That was the money of the people who used to be the customers of the bank, money of the shareholders. What the government is doing is just bringing justice. If the people or the individual committed a crime in Kazakhstan, the law enforcement authorities are obliged to bring them to justice. And this is the end of the story. Whilst it is in Ablazov's interest to remain uh, and keep a low profile, whilst he's in prison professing his innocence, we have compelling evidence to show that, in fact, 
he is running the whole operation through his son-in-law, Krapanov, um, and through the, then thereafter the lawyers and fiduciaries that his son-in-law is instructing. And basically the whole operation is to filter the monies they've stolen from the peoples of Kazakhstan into the Western banking system. As well as issuing non-repayable loans, senior figures at the bank were also involved in another illegal practice meant to artificially inflate BTA's market value. During the criminal investigation, we detected an unfounded increase in the bank's market capitalization. It had been what they call pumped up. The bank's market capitalization was increased through the illegal practice of bank issuing loans to itself. As time goes on, we will be able to confirm the total value of the damage done. Former senior BTA bank executives insist they knew nothing of the multi-billion dollar fraud taking place right under their noses. Firstly, no one in the bank knew that he was planning to embezzle money. Everyone thought that he was using the assets to increase the bank's market capitalization, and after they were sold, the assets would be returned to the bank itself. I understood that some bank funds were being used to finance its projects or increase its market capitalization, and of course, everyone understood that a crisis was looming. And I also understood that it would now be impossible to sell the project or the bank at a substantial profit. This pumping up of the bank's value served two purposes. To the outside world, it made it appear as if the bank was prospering under Ablyazov's chairmanship. Internally, many senior bank figures, knowing the rate of loans leaving the bank was unprecedented, could turn a blind eye to the possibility actual embezzlement was taking place and instead the lesser crime of artificially increasing the bank's value. One would imagine the only way to commit this fraud is you couldn't do this at a junior level in the bank because you would be oversight. But as he was a chairman and the largest shareholder of the bank, so he was getting his own bank to lend companies that he was the, the real beneficial owner but hidden using nominee directors, dupes, to front these companies, lending himself money which will never be returned. Close family ties, including those established through marriage, are a central part of Kazakh culture. Some have accused the former head of the BTA bank of exploiting this central cultural value for his own ends. Erlan Kosayev, a surgeon from Almaty and one of the nominal directors of Ablyazov's shell companies. Kosayev is alleged to have collaborated with Ablyazov's syndicate. He insists it was loyalty to his sister-in-law, who worked at BTA, that drew him into the fraud. Anyway, my sister-in-law worked at the bank. She was due to go on maternity leave. She married very late on and was going to have a baby. Usually, maternity leave starts when you are seven months pregnant. She was already eight months pregnant, but they didn't let her go. She explained that part of her work involves signing some documents. She was meant to find someone to sign the documents for her while she was away on maternity leave. In Kazakhstan, it's part of our national identity that we look after our relatives. So I thought there wouldn't be any harm if it was me who signed the documents for her during her maternity leave. That is how I came to be involved in the BTA bank case. Kosayev is currently facing charges in Kazakhstan for his part in the fraud. He claims to have been unwittingly duped into becoming a company director for one of the fraudulent businesses set up by Ablyazov. But prosecutors remain deeply skeptical of his story. Would you go to the lengths? Would you become a criminal accomplice? in an effort to help your sister who worked at the bank? I don't think so. I don't think that defence would run. Uh, I can't imagine any judge saying to him, oh, you were helping your sister, well done you. He knew he was doing something illegal. I'm very certain he knew it, because this uh, level of naivety, how did he become a consultant surgeon? If he's as naive as that. A few months after being appointed as a director, Kosayev was invited to attend a meeting at a cafe in Almaty. When we came to this cafe, there were an awful lot of other people besides me. I wasn't the only one. We were told it was vital that we travel to Bishkek for a consultation. 
We were told the consultation would last no more than two weeks. We were told to get our things. We were given money then and there to pay for our travel. I think $1,000. And we went and packed, and then everyone went there. Kosayev returned to the cafe with a suitcase and claims he expected the briefing to last no more than two weeks. Muratbek Katibayev, a close political associate of Ablyazov, told Kosayev he had to travel to Moscow to continue his work as a nominal director of one of the front companies. But Ablyazov also needed people on the inside to approve the loan applications. Sol Bullet Canova, BTA's former executive director of loans. Bullet Canova has served a prison sentence for her part in the fraud. She told investigators the sham loan applications were processed in the same way as genuine loan requests. Uh, I, as a member of the loan committee, receive an application for the purchase of a plot of land and for the construction there of a residential development, followed by its resale for the purpose of generating profit. In other words, a business idea. I do my work, I analyze the project in terms of its viability and the payback period, and as a member of the loan committee, I say yes, this project is interesting, that is all. We were charged under the article relating to aiding and abetting embezzlement, and the main person who perpetrated the embezzlement was, as I understood it, Ablyazov. And as the inquiry interpreted it, we were accessories to that embezzlement. Bullet Canova believes she paid a high price for her part in the crime and was misled by the former BTA bank chairman. I feel deceived. How else could I feel? Most of all, I feel sad for my child who suffered as a result of me not being there. Yes, of course. As serious questions began to be raised at BTA, Ablyazov went on the propaganda offensive. He established and funded a number of media companies that proceeded to broadcast his version of events. I wouldn't say I feel hugely negative about the verdict because the accusations are simply nonsensical, not based on anything. The lawyers proved the case far too easily. Now we are going to launch a supervisory appeal. But we understand there is a political motive behind all this, it is senseless, but we want to show the whole world the extent to which our judicial system is rotten and how biased it is. But according to experts in body language and behavior, Ablyazov's performances in these television interviews were less than convincing. Susan Constantine is a behavioral investigator who has worked closely with the US Justice Department and law enforcement agencies and specializes in nonverbal communication. First of all, we had 23 videos. So the main thing for me to is to be able to kind of determine his norm. One video really is not sufficient, but basically looking at several of them, I start to see a pattern. So there are certain things that I'm looking for. One is I'm watching his facial expressions and I'm looking for things that are disconnecting with his voice inflection, um, what he's actually saying. Is there anything in there that seems to contradict? After evaluating all 23 videos, I found a pattern of his behavior. And it was really interesting because there are what we call pockets of anxiety. Areas where increased gesturing or increased movement that was different from the norm, based on the 23 videos that I had seen. So what I noticed specifically when he was asked a question, that was creating anxiety because anxiety generally is there's some underlying story there that it could be that he's trying to hold, withhold, trying to conceal or dis be deceptive. What I found was in the areas of deception, it depended on the interviewer that he was talking with. The person that he had control over, there was a female person that he was talking to, somebody that was investigating him or interviewing him, and he felt that he had control over them. He seemed very still. That actually is a sign of deceptive behavior because if they normally talk with their hand gestures, the change would be they're very still and they're very frozen in space. So that there were many times where he didn't gesture at all, his face was very flat and affect. So what he was doing was concealing his true emotions because everything that you think or feel is going to be exhibited through your nonverbal communication. 
BTA investigators believe Abliazov hoped to deflect attention away from his fraudulent activity by politically attacking his homeland. Driving this media strategy was Abliazov's head of security, Alexander Pavlov. Pavlov is wanted in Kazakhstan, accused of carrying out terrorist offences in the country, and despite securing political asylum in Spain, remains on Interpol's wanted list. For myself, being a, I was born in Kazakhstan, I grew up over there, my family lives there, and for Mr. Abliazov that was the same at some point. For me that was really strange why the man who was born, grew up, made his fortune in a country, tell for the whole world so much bad thing about his motherland that are not true. I see the only goal is just to discreditize the current government, the president, and he failed it. But propaganda alone could not disguise the scale of Abliazov's activity. And sensing the net was closing in, the tycoon fled to the UK and claimed political asylum. Initially, authorities believed his story. But when legal proceedings began in the British courts to identify and recover Abliazov's assets, serious questions began to be raised over the nature and scale of his wealth. Ignoring numerous court judgments ordering him to disclose the full details of his fortune, Abliazov was eventually found guilty of contempt of court and sentenced to almost two years' imprisonment. The conclusions of some of Britain's leading judges was damning. Mr. Abliazov no longer maintains even a pretense, as he once did, of being willing to abide by the orders of the court. Mr. Abliazov is a persistent and serial contemnor. Mr. Abliazov's contempts have been multiple, persistent and protracted, have embraced the offences of non-disclosure, lying in cross-examination and dealing with assets, and have been supported by the suborning of false testimony and the forging of documents. It is difficult to imagine a party to commercial litigation who has acted with more cynicism, opportunism and deviousness towards court orders than Mr. Abliazov. But by the time Lord Justice Tyr sentenced Abliazov to prison, the former banker had fled again, this time to France. Using his own television channel, he later implied the UK judges were acting at the behest of the BTA bank. By a quick result, they meant putting me in prison. So they initiated proceedings for so-called contempt of court. What form did my contempt of court take? I didn't declare all of my assets. The bank is claiming that there are companies and properties that I did not disclose, but that in fact belong to me. For this, they are demanding the maximum sentence for me, two years in prison. That is the essence of their accusation, which the bank rather creatively filed on the 16th of May, my birthday. The contempt was created by himself in lying to the judge. And I don't believe for a moment that the Kazakhstan government, in whatever shape or form, has any influence over the High Court in London. I think it's preposterous to suggest that. But this is part of, I'm the victim. The Kazakhs are wrong, the Russians are wrong, Ukrainians are wrong. He stated in a letter he thinks the world of the British justice, except when it comes to actually accepting the sentence handed down. All the legal stuff is happening in the United Kingdom. We have the big judgment in Switzerland, in the States, in France. So it's not the Kazakh court or Kazakh prosecutors who are blaming Mr. Abliazov or who are saying that he's a fraudster. It was the High Court of Justice, London, clearly stated that this guy is the fraudster. For 18 months, Abliazov remained on the run in France, evading both state and private investigators. But on the 22nd of July 2013, at the High Court in London, investigators finally made a breakthrough. Olena Tyshenko, the glamorous Ukrainian lawyer who played a pivotal legal role in creating the shell companies Abliazov would use to hide the money. Tyshenko was also alleged to have drawn up false contracts for the project applications to the bank and applied for government approvals. Crucially, she created the relevant corporate structures and appointed the nominal directors and key people needed to cover up the fraud. 
Yelena Tushenko is another colourful character in all this. A stunning blonde who advised Ablazov. Um, the Russians believe she advised Ablazov on how to hide his money and how to set up companies. She's a lawyer. She was followed when she left the High Court to go and visit Ablazov in the south of France. She was followed by security teams who were surveilling her on behalf of the bank, the BTA bank. They followed her to the villa in the, the south of France. They noticed that Ablazov was there and the Ukrainian authorities, because he was arrested on a Ukrainian warrant, informed the French police and there was a massive operation to swoop him up. They also believed that he may have armed security with him, so the French police went in very, very heavy. And uh, but no one was injured. He didn't have a massive security operation. As police entered the property, they found Abliazov sitting at his computer. In another part of the secluded luxury villa was his sister, Galka. Galka Abliazova, the oligarch's sister who was granted political asylum in the US in 2004. Abliazov has routinely made payments to his sister, some in excess of a million dollars, which the former BTA chairman describes as gifts. She told investigators she is regularly in contact with her brother by phone. Under heavy armed guard and with a police helicopter overhead, Abliazov was finally taken into custody. Jody Hudson, Gauka's American partner, had hired the villa using an offshore account. Jody Hudson holds a senior position with the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission and previously worked with two other US federal departments. Hudson is also known to have rented the other villas used by Abliazov in the period leading up to his arrest. Despite his obvious involvement, Hudson declined to be interviewed for this film. They live in a very palatial home in the suburbs of McLean, Virginia. Um, we have posed the question to people, is he connected with the, the Alphabet Agency, the CIA, that's based in Langley just down the road? And I can't get a comment denying or confirming it. But they live a very plush lifestyle. That's undoubted from the property and from their Facebook pages. They love to take holidays and go here and go there. Now, here is a US citizen working for the federal government, knowing that his girlfriend's brother was on the run. In other words, a felon on the run he decides to rent and pay for a house for him. Now, is he going to be investigated? There's a possibility the federal authorities in the United States may wish to investigate him for a potential felony prosecution. But prosecutions were taking place elsewhere. Within a month of Abliazov's capture, the woman who had led police to him Olena Tushenko was brought before the Sverskaya court in Moscow in handcuffs, charged with assisting her former boss with embezzling and money laundering billions. She is uh, sent to prison. She comes out of prison and she moves to Ukraine and immediately, almost immediately, gets a job as the deputy head of the president's administrative corps. Now, she's very recently been appointed to be the chief anti-money laundering. So now, Tushenko, having spent years showing Ablazov how to hide the money, is now going to be helping the Ukrainians recover hundreds of millions or billions that's been defrauded from Ukraine. Whilst the deal has not been without criticism, Kazakh investigators believe the Ukrainians have made a shrewd move in appointing Tushenko to lead the country's anti-corruption unit. It is the classic case of the poacher turned gamekeeper. And I was quite shocked to see that, but the Ukrainians must believe that she has skills. Last year, she was caught in Russia, got into jail, and then she agreed to make a deal with the investigation so as to cooperate in, in the governments, both governments, I mean Russian and Kazakh, in their force of bringing justice to Mr. Ablazov and his affiliates. 
But what about the man who is the head of the syndicate? France has no extradition treaty with Kazakhstan, but both Russia and Ukraine have actively sought to bring Abliazov to trial in their countries, where investigators believe billions more have been embezzled by the organized criminal gang. At his court appearances, Abliazov's closest family members, including his parents, wife and sister, along with Jody Hudson, have all attended court to support the former BTA chairman. Once again, Abliazov's lawyers ignore the mountain of evidence against their client, relying instead on unfounded allegations that he would eventually be sent to Kazakhstan to face torture and death. Since in reality this concerns the conditions of the arrest of Mukhtar Abliazov, which are particularly scandalous, notably because the arrest was at the request of the Ukrainian authorities, since it is with this arrest warrant that Mukhtar Abliazov was not only detained, but in extremely ambiguous and violent conditions, and therefore, of course, we are asking the court to set up an inquiry to look into the conditions of his arrest and thus the subsequent procedure. Now it's up to the government. The government has to uh, make a decision. It has to decide whether or not it will issue a decree to extradite Mr. Abliazov. I find it... Uh, uh, unbelievable, unimaginable that the French government would send a political opponent, a dissident, to a country where dissidents get murdered in the street. The Conseil d'État will look at the entire case and it will look at the political nature of the case. This is a fundamentally political case. Uh, and the Conseil d'État will look at that and after the Conseil d'État, there's also the European Court of Human Rights that can issue an injunction to stop his extradition. So in terms of uh, uh, legal road, there's still quite a lot of uh, road to travel ahead for Mr. Biazzo. But those who have studied the case believe the only political objectives are those of Abliazov himself. Has he uh, an enormous ego, uh, a need to be a president? Does he want to be the president of Kazakhstan? I, I don't know. He has made a fortune before the bank. He was a very wealthy man before he took over at the bank from, from a country that he has very little regard for. For others, especially for many Kazakhs, they believe Abliazov has not only damaged the country economically, but also undermined Kazakhstan's global reputation and, in doing so, placed his entire family at risk of imprisonment for their part in his crime. How dare you to act in such a bad manner against your country, against your own people, against the citizens of Kazakhstan and its public policy. In Kazakhstan, I think every man who wants or makes a fortune, he might have some problems at some stage. But being a man, my view is that when you face those problems, you must draw a clear line between yourself and your family. If he will be sent to Russia or Ukraine, we will never see him again. And my, my children will never meet him. And from my personal point of view, this is the most mistake of Mr. Ablazov. His idea is to trust just the family members. But this trust might be in a form of providing a power of attorney, of creating a big corporate structure which would be just a money laundering technique for his sister, for his sister's husband, for his own son-in-law or even daughter. What I mean is that we have to, now, right now, the bank has to, and the government has to, go after his relatives, son-in-law, daughter, sister, because they're spending our money. They're buying, they're living luxury lives in the States, buying houses in California, making business in Silicon Valley, riding Bentleys, flying own jets. We're not comfortable with that. Today, Abliazov is being held in detention in the notorious French prison of Fleury-Merogui, just south of Paris, 
playing chess with himself and pondering his future. And perhaps more. Abliazov always wanted more, and those who have tracked his movements believe the theft he committed during his time at the BTA continues as the former tycoon directs operations from his prison cell. I assume he's allowed to have a meetings being in a prison with his relatives, wife, daughter, son-in-law, and maybe I assume he provides some instructions while those short meetings to the counterparties who does the business for him worldwide. But I'm also pretty sure because the amount of money is such is very big and the amount of people dealing with that is also not small. That's why sitting in a prison in France and being able to control so much jurisdiction, so much people is not, it's just not possible. Um, for the bank, yes, we will recover more than we have so far. It's not a straightforward process. Um, Mr. Abliazov and those around him continue to take as many steps as they can to, to hide the assets, to salt the money away. Um, but yes, we are confident we will continue to recover money, but it will take time. Investigators believe the scale and cost of this crime will continue to soar even higher, beyond 10 and possibly as high as $20 billion worldwide, enough dollar bills that if laid end to end would circle the world 77 times. All the time, the net continues to close. Uh, I'm aware that a good number of people who were involved with Mr. Abliazov has been um, prosecuted and some have served prison time. Uh, Mr. Abliazov is the subject of a, uh, at least two extradition requests from where he's currently held in France to Russia and to the Ukraine and it seems that he may have to face justice for at least some of what he's done. Curiously, the UK authorities, which sentenced Abliazov to 22 months, have not sought his extradition from France, something that former officers at the Serious Fraud Office have found surprising. I am surprised, however I can understand it, because the resources required would be tremendous. Because not only do you investigate the UK aspect, then you, you then have to investigate the aspect of wherever that money is coming from. So for instance, although a, a straightforward money laundering investigation in, in the UK would be able to be conducted, you would also have to conduct the investigation in Switzerland, BVI, Panama, Cyprus, over to Kazakhstan for the original source of the money, etc. It is a tremendous amount of resource that I don't think they have the capability to provide. The SFO deny lack of resources are an obstacle to pursuing Abliazov, but can't explain why the UK is not actively seeking the tycoon's extradition. The billions of dollars Abliazov and his associates stole from the BTA bank has allowed them to enjoy the most luxurious sights and sounds that money can buy. But as investigators close in, there is one sound Abliazov's syndicate will need to get used to.